why don't we go ahead and get started with today's program. To go to the next slide, please, we will show you uh, here, here are the issues that we'd like to address on today's webinar. Uh, I will be addressing the privacy and consumer data issues, as well as open access and exclusivity. Next, uh, Gail Levine will address the restrictive labor agreement issue, nascent competition issues, and uh, recent changes to bank merger approval or proposed changes. Lastly, uh, Airly will be addressing burgeoning UK antitrust cl class action issues, as well as the increased UK and EU regulatory uh, attention that has, has come to fore. Go to the next slide, please. So, as I noted kind of at the beginning, one of the issues that's really getting a lot of attention these days, particularly from regulators, but also in the litigation space in the United States, is the focus on privacy and the use of consumer data. I mean, you generally can't go another day uh, without reading the, the trade press and seeing a new regulatory announcement or action or a new lawsuit that's in the space. But as with all things, I think it's helpful to step back and look a little bit at the chronology and to see how things have evolved so you understand how we've gotten to where we are today. Uh, and although this necessarily isn't the, the beginning of it, yeah, you, you can see as, as recently as 2019, Assistant Attorney General Delrahim gave a speech at Harvard Law School where he talked about, among other things, that the digital marketplace isn't immune from a lot of the competition issues that we've, we've had to sort through in the past. And that antitrust regulators are going to start looking at the digital marketplace through the lens of, of competition. And one of the things that I think that you saw and you might see as a little bit of a shift right now is with the prior administration, I think there was largely a push to use existing tools within the regulatory toolbox to look at some of the emerging technologies. But what you've started to see is a little bit of a shift where even though the existing toolbox is still on the, the tool bench, to so to say, there are other tools that are being added to it as well. And where that comes into play is it really kind of started last summer with President Biden's Executive Order 40036, which was issued in July of last year. And President Biden announced that it, he, was, he was asking the FTC to, to start examining practices in the digital marketplace that could inhibit competition. And in particular, President Biden suggested the FTC look at its statutory rulemaking authority to look at unfair data collection and surveillance practices that could damage competition, consumer autonomy, and consumer privacy. So even though the executive order didn't you know, obviously initiate anything, it kind of initiated the discussion that started to take place over the next year or two uh, that, that, we've, that we've seen. So if we could go to the next slide, I'd like to talk about what that executive order has kind of laid the groundwork for. And one of the, I think that the key areas is to look at what the FTC has said, uh, both to Congress and to the marketplace recently. And in September of last year, the FTC issued a report to Congress. And in that report, the FTC, FTC noted that it will be spending more time on the overlap between data privacy and competition issues. And that in the FTC's words, many of the largest players in the digital marketplace are as powerful as they are because of the access to this consumer data. And what the F FTC noted about here is that they claim to have a structural advantage over some of their counterparts in other jurisdictions, given that they have a long, they've had a long time focus on data and privacy in other aspects of their work, such as the Graham Leach Bliley Act, the FCRA, the CAN Spam Act, and so forth. So that the message from the FTC is we have experience in this area and we are going to use that experience as we take on some of the new practices that have come into place in FinTech and other technology spaces over the last few years. And in particular in the report, the FTC highlighted four key areas that they're going to be looking at, that they're going to be integrating competition concerns into part of their existing and their new analyses that they perform. They're going to be focusing on advancing remedies. Uh, and, and what they mean by advancing remedies is looking at both monetary and non-monetary relief, providing increased notice to consumers, and to make sure that any of the, quote, kind of ill-gotten benefit of that is, is uh, by a company who is who has acted improperly is not used for that company's benefit. Uh, three, they're going to be focusing on digital platforms. And then fourth, expanding on consumer protection issues involving the, the use of algorithms kind of across the board. So with that report, the, the FTC clearly made an announcement to the market that it is going to be focusing 
on, on consumer data. And as you can imagine, there are a lot of issues where this will come into play in, in the fintech space, given the access to fintech uh, that fintech has to some of the most kind of um, interesting and some of the, the the most integral part of data that consumers have, which is usually kind of their payment and, and uh, information and how they spend their money. If we go to the next slide, please. And one of the things I think that is interesting to a lot of antitrust and fintech observers is that it's not just the DOJ and the FTC that is looking at this space, but now it's also the CFPB as well, which obviously has been very active in kind of uh, the financial services regulatory space, but they have made very clear that they are now going to start looking at this issue through the through a competition lens as well. And what you saw in October of last year is that the CFPB in the payment space in particular issued orders asking for payment data going from 2019 through 2021 to some of the largest tech and, and, and fintech players in the space. And as Director Chopra mentioned in, in uh, when that order came out, that the payments business and network business can gain tremendous scale market power. And they want to then look at that market power through the competition lens that one might not have associated the CFPB using in the past. Um, and as I, I said earlier, I think you know one of the reasons why the, the payment space is in is so interesting and why you see in kind of the the, the fintech space why there's a lot of about there's a lot of battle uh, brewing about kind of deposit accounts and consumer accounts is because the information that one has by looking at for example a checking account is really invaluable when it comes to the consumer data because if you look at someone's checking account for a month you know where they spend money and you know some of their other uh, purchasing preferences which can be very valuable from a technological and a fintech standpoint knowing uh, that kind of insight into the consumer and i think one of the, the things that really stood out too as part of the cfpb's uh statements from october is they are going to be working with other regulators in the space too so it's not just the CFPB or the FTC, but it's going to be a joint effort where they look at some of these issues together, kind of given the, the overlap that exists. So uh, if we could go to the next slide, uh, one of the other areas that I just kind of want to touch on in addition to kind of, and they're somewhat related, but in addition to the pure kind of data privacy and, and data uh, aspects that we were looking at is the, the issue of kind of open access and exclusivity. And I think this is this is particularly important now, given that the lines are starting to blur between traditional fintech and what we'll you know, refer to as the tech fin, which is big tech looking to enter the fintech space as well. And as those lines continue to break down, and there, there's more of integration between those two, you've seen a very rare, I would say, bipartisan push in Congress to tackle this issue. Uh, where uh, there, there's been uh, there's been efforts on both sides of the aisle, and I think where you see this the most, and probably the, the the bill that has the most attention right now, is the American Innovation and Choice Online Act, which is Senate Bill 2992, which was introduced uh, last October. Uh, it was it was sponsored by Senator Klobuchar, but there are also six Democratic and six Republican co-sponsors for that bill, and it's a complex bill, and we don't have the time to get into all the nuances of it. But suffice to say, the, the, the general uh, approach of the bill would be that if you are designated as a covered platform, which again, I'm oversimplifying here, but it'd be a large online platform that, that satisfies certain numbers when it comes to the user base or to market capitalization. If you, you get that designation as a covered platform, it would make unlawful for uh, giving preferences to your own products or lines of business over those of competitors who are out there. So again, you, you can imagine the, the ramifications here uh, you know, on a, a number of levels. If you're a big tech company and you acquire a FinTech, uh, are you giving an unlawful preference by trying to integrate that FinTech into your existing business model and your user base? Um, to go to, for example, the payment space that we talked about before, you know, imagine that you are a large uh, uh, tech company that acquires a FinTech that has its own payment process. And you have users who then want to use a competing payment process. You know, what type of, of open access will you need to provide so that when that user wants to pay someone at the grocery store or wants to pay a friend or pay their landscaper, that they can use their existing payment source rather than you know, a new payment source uh, that, that comes into play. Those are the kinds of issues that I think everyone's going to have to wrestle with. And, and again, the reason that we call this out is because 
unlike a lot of other bills that are out there, this one really does have a fair amount of bipartisan support. So it'll be interesting to see how this bill works its way, if it does, through Congress and what the ramifications will be for both, not only the FinTech space, but also the tech fin, you know, large big tech that's coming in and acquiring FinTechs or partnering with FinTechs, as well as traditional financial institutions. Uh, it's an area that's very active, and I think everyone in the industry will want to keep their eye on as we go forward. So with that said, I'd like to turn it over to my partner now, Gail Levine, who will go through uh, some of the topics that, that, that we've noted here as well. Sure. Thanks so much, Tom. I really appreciate it. Um, so one of the issues when you're in the fintech space is recognizing that a lot of the value of your company and a lot of the in innovation and uh, inspiration for your company comes from your talents, right? It comes from the people you've hired to work uh, to work along with you to make your your uh, uh, company grow. Um, when you're thinking about the competition for that top talent, one of the issues we wanted to sort of call out here and just alert folks to are the antitrust issues at play. There have been there has the Justice Department has brought a series of cases, criminal cases challenging agreements among companies not to poach each other's employees. Think here about agreements where company A and company B agree not to hire away each other's key personnel. Um, wage fixing and no poach agreements are deemed per se illegal by the Justice Department unless it's some necessary part of some larger, quite legitimate collaboration. And that's a footnote that should be explored you know, quite quite at length if uh, that you're in this space. Um, and this comes up a lot in spaces where the talent is scarce and valuable and when talent, that, that may well describe the talent in the FinTech space. Some very practical tips that we're advising clients on in this space is, you know, avoid sharing with your competitors what you pay your team members or, and that's not just salary, that's terms and conditions of employment too. Uh, think twice about whether you want to agree with your competitors to not poach each other's talent or not hire away each other's talent. Um, if there's a real need, a business need to do something not quite, uh, not wage fixing, not no poach, but in that space, there's a there may well be a way to get to yes, um, but you need to be smart, you need to be strategic, and you need to be well informed. So that's, that's something that uh, you might want to reach out to outside counsel to see if you can do it. Now, I, I mention all of this in full recognition that DOJ, not, uh, it, it's not enough to say that DOJ has brought a series of criminal cases uh, recently. It's true that they've lost a number of those cases. Uh, I think um, in the last month or two, there's been a number of DOJ losses in this space. Um, you know, the, the DOJ's, uh, DOJ announced uh, just only a few years ago that this kind of conduct would be criminally uh, uh, in play, or at least they articulated it in a report that was issued a couple of years ago. Uh, and the, the cases have not all gone DOJ's way, to be, to be sure. But future cases are pending. And just as a practical matter, if you're, uh, if you're advising your clients or if you're in-house yourself, um, even, the, um, even if you are later vindicated in trial, at trial, uh, these cases can be a um, considerable distraction, um, uh, both on a personal level and on a corporate level. So, you know, you think hard about whether that's a place you want to be. Next slide, please. Another big issue in the fintech space is, of course, the question of nascent competition. Everyone knows a merger of two big companies, two big rivals can raise antitrust issues. That's no surprise. But what happens when a big incumbent buys the small, scrappy, next big thing, there can be antitrust risks in that space too. And that's especially true in a market like FinTech where things are fast moving, where things are in it, where, where, where work is innovative and uh, technology leapfrogs. A couple of examples from one from the Justice Department's recent uh, catalog of cases and one from the Federal Trade Commission's. The Justice Department brought a case a number of years ago challenging Visa and Plaid, where at least according to the complaints, uh, DOJ called Visa the monopolist in this space, and it, DOJ called Plaid the nascent competitor in the field. And it's it's challenged the 
um, uniting of those two in, as a single entity. DOJ challenged the deal, this is now a couple of years ago, and the parties abandoned. Similarly, at the FTC, uh, the Federal Trade Commission challenged a merger between a proposed merger between Illumina and Pacific Biosciences, uh, two companies in the healthcare space. Illumina, according to the complaint, had 90% of the market, and PacBio had, according to the complaint, something like two or three percent of the market. But, and this is the significant part of the complaint, Bio, uh, Pacific Biosciences was a nascent and growing competitor, according to the complaint, and that uh, led the FTC uh, to say in its complaints that this was a case of nascent competition. Again, the parties abandoned the deal. Some practical tips if you're in this space or you're counseling in this space, your documents matter. Uh, if you read, for example, the Illumina Pack Bio uh, com uh, administrative complaint issued by the Federal Trade Commission, you will see the agency citing document, internal document after internal document. So uh, this is true in antitrust generally, but it's certainly true here. Uh, what the clients, or rather what the parties are saying in their documents makes a difference. Uh, there's also, just as a practical matter, the point of litigation risk. Uh, it may well be that the deal is perfectly benign as an antitrust matter, but it may also be that the agency sees things differently than the parties do. Um, if the parties believe the case is benign, uh, but the antitrust agencies don't, it may well be a situation where you, uh, the parties may want to bring their case to trial. And in that case, you just want to have let litigation risk in mind and be litigation ready. Next slide, please. Finally, uh, the end, another issue on the antitrust front that FinTech needs, that FinTech practitioners and their counsel need to know about is the new uh, developments in the world of bank mergers. Late last year, the DOJ's antitrust division announced that it's going to be reconsidering or considering whether it should revise the way it reviews bank mergers. Now, this is an enterprise that was started in 2020, uh, where the DOJ asked a series of questions about how it should think about bank mergers, solicited public comment. No, no changes resulted from that particular inquiry. Maybe, however, we will see uh, changes developing from this inquiry. The questions on the table here are the ones that DOJ is asking in a longer document that's available online. You can click on this link to have it. But you know, some of the um, questions are, for example, does DOJ, <clears throat> is DOJ's review today currently stopping harmful mergers? Or does DOJ, when it looks at bank mergers, is it reviewing the full range of competitive factors? Should the antitrust division of the Justice Department apply different standards for bank mergers versus other mergers? Should it think about additional remedies for bank mergers? And how should antitrust officials, particularly those at the Justice Department reviewing bank deals, how should they consider internet only banks? What, what role do they play in the competitive analysis? That's the sort of suite of issues that DOJ is considering. There was a call, the DOJ, as I mentioned, called for public comment on it, and those public comments are all online today and accessible online today. DOJ, I understand, is reviewing those, thinking the issues through, and we should uh, we are awaiting next steps from DOJ on that front. May I turn it over now to Airly? Thank you, Gail. Following on from the US updates, I'm now going to give you a UK perspective with a very quick canter through the significant developments we've been seeing here in antitrust opt-out class actions, the growth of funders here, and the increased regulatory interest in fintech in the UK. Before diving in, I want to flag that I'm sp speaking specifically about the opt-out collective actions regime in the Specialist Competition Appeals Tribunal, or CAT for short, for private damages claims that was introduced in 2015. This is separate from, and in addition to, the representative claims and group litigation order regimes in place more broadly. And it's also separate from the mass damages claims that are also in the CAT and those that are increasingly being referred from our High Court. Now, I'm conscious also in speaking about this burgeoning of that regime that I'm speaking to an audience that's familiar with the significantly more developed approach in the US. The message that I want you to take away from today is that although this regime is in its infancy, 
With each decision, we're getting greater clarity on its reach. And to date, it's all been very encouraging for claimants with one instance that puts some boundaries on that. But for a long time, it just didn't seem that this regime was going to take off at all. To bring a class action in the CAT on an opt-out basis, a proposed class representative has to apply for a class certification from the CAT called a class represent, uh, sorry, a collective proceedings order or CPO before the case can proceed. To grant a CPO, the CAT must be satisfied of a, nom a number of preliminary elements, including that the claims are suitable to be brought in collective proceedings. We got held up here at that first stage on the question of suitability for six years, as one of the first applications for a CPO made its way through our appeal system. Initially, the CAT rejected the application on the basis that the claims weren't suitable to be brought as a collective action due to the lack of certainty that the proposed expert methodology would be able to prove the level of overcharge because this involved businesses passing on an overcharging credit card fees to consumers. We, they weren't certain that the expert methodology was going to be actually able to prove the level of overcharge passed on to the individual consumers. Now, ultimately, our Supreme Court gave the green light in late 2020, and in doing so, the court emphasised the purpose of the regime is to bring justice, when pursuing traditional forms of individual claims would prove inadequate, and Lord Briggs's comments are there in, in quotes on the slide. The CAT then granted the first CPO in Merricks in August 2021. Since then, we've had four further opt-out CPOs granted, two rejected, and another nine registered for which certification is pending. Some excitable practitioners and consumer rights advocates have indulged in some hyperbole, describing this as the opening of the floodgates. But there are also some recent indications that the CAT is taking seriously its gatekeeper role. So we've had the Merricks CPO, followed by La Patrol, which was a, stand a standalone damages claim brought on behalf of a much smaller pool of um, class members, 2.3 million voice-only landline, landline consumers of UK's lar largest telco who allegedly subjected them to excessive pricing. We've had two P CPOs granted to Mr Gutman concerning standalone damages claims against UK railway operators who allegedly overcharged fares. And then the fifth CPO granted to Mr McLaren concerns a follow-on damages claims regarding a roll-on, roll-off car shipping cartel. We've then hit something of a speed bump when the CAT refused to grant either of the CPOs sought in relation to the damages claims following on from a commission decision that the banking defendants had participated in foreign exchange spot trading cartels. And these proceedings were set to be the first in which the CAT was called on to consider competing class representatives to decide which of them was going to be the more appropriate. But that question has been postponed, perhaps permanently in these proceedings, with the PCRs being sent away to try and correct the flaws identified in their claims and come back for a second bite of the cherry, albeit next time on an opt-in basis. So these proceedings have therefore switched their claim to fame from being the first to determine a carriage dispute to the first CPOs to not be granted post merics there's then a clutch of CPOs still awaiting certification, including three that see big tech being drawn into standalone damages claims for applicants seeking opt out class certification in the UK for the alleged abuse of their dominant position here, including through allegedly unfair terms and conditions and allegedly excessive and unlawful pricing. I'm now going to give you a very quick overview of what you in the fintech sector should be taking from our recently granted CPOs. Next slide, please. Most importantly, the threshold for certification is much lower than initially imposed by the CAT. There's to be no mini trial to determine the issue of suitability. However, the CAT must be satisfied that there is a plausible and realistic method of ca calculating aggregate damages across the class. Guided by the Supreme Court's decision in Merricks, the CAT has confirmed that this is not a particularly high bar. There appears to be little or no substantive requirement on the part of individual claimants to show proof of loss. And the CAT has specifically acknowledged that at this early certification stage, there will be limited factual evidence to support the development of a methodology. It's not the role of the tribunal to determine the merits and robustness of the expert methodology at this certification stage. And it's sufficient that it be provisional and adapted as the litigation progresses. So far, so very claimant friendly. However, 
it is not open slather. Most recently, the, the cat has flexed its gatekeeper muscles and has refused to grant the opt-out CPOs, which I've just seen there's a question on this. CPO stands for a collective proceedings order. It's the very first stage in this regime that you need to have the cat grant before you can take your case further. So it refused to grant these CPOs sought in the FX cases due to the weaknesses on this very issue of whether there's a plausible and realistic method of calculating aggregate damages across the class. The CAT considered it, that neither PCR had properly demonstrated how the defendants had caused the alleged damages and were overly reliant on the economic theory of pass on. As I said, the potential CPRs have been sent away to try and correct these flaws. And this, de this decision in particular highlights the importance of experts even at this early stage and getting the balance and approach right, notwithstanding the lower threshold. We've also learned on suitability that the CAT must consider that the claims are more appropriately dealt with collectively than individually, but from the perspective of the class members, not from the proposed class representative. In the FX CPOs, the CAT emphasised that it is not sufficient for a PCR to point to the impracticability for them of opt-in proceedings, the question is more nuanced, whether it is impractical for the class members to opt in. Now, in granting the second CPO, where the class pool was significantly smaller than that in Merrick's, the CAT was persuaded by the class representative that although claimants should easily be able to be identified by the defendant because they were a relatively small subset of their customers, such potential claimants would be unlikely to opt in due to their own age and circumstances, they were seen as a particularly vulnerable group of customers and particularly given the claim's technical nature. Now we may see the CAT take this more inclusive, flexible approach when considering any future CPOs that are sought on behalf of consumers relating to the relatively complex products and services offered by the FinTech sector. Recently, one of these proposed class representatives in one of the big tech CPOs that is awaiting class certification spoke frankly about what she saw as being the ambivalence and disempowerment of potential claimants regarding business practices in this sector. The PCR thought that the significant rise in the importance of this issue had been highlighted by the habitual use of fintech which had increased over the COVID period and it highlighted the importance of opt-out collective actions now that there's a greater pool of participating consumers who may at the same time be not sufficiently motivated to actually opt in. While we're on the issue of class definition, we learned more recently in the Merrick's proceedings that deceased claimants in the UK who were alive when the claim was commenced can continue to be class members. Now, as an aside, the CAT has been criticised for where it um, let the two FX CPOs develop to. It let them develop over a long period of time. And PCRs have also complained about the length of time and cost it takes to have the certification stage dealt with. With each decision we get from the CAT, we learn more about how it will implement and administer the CPO regime. And the process is less likely, is more likely to become less onerous, encouraging further growth in applications. Also, the UK government last week pledged to conduct a review into the CAT rules after a CMA consultation suggested several amendments to streamline its pro procedures. And I should specify there that the CMA is the UK Competition Authority. Now, it's also important to note that all of the CPA, CPO applications made to date are known to have involved third party funding to some extent. Litigation funding is another area where the UK is experiencing rapid growth, although again, we are somewhat behind our US friends. Funders know that class actions can be lucrative, particularly follow on damages claims, where you don't need to spend resources establishing liability. Further, the CAT confirmed in Merrick's that funders can be paid out of unclaimed damages, increasing the attractiveness of the opt out regime. Now, little detail about funding arrangements is publicly available. And after a contested hearing in one of the big tech CPOs that are still to be granted, the CAT has confirmed that after the, inf after the event, insurance details should remain confidential and that the proposed class representative there was not required to disclose the success fees payable under the confidential fee arrangements that she had entered into with her legal team. And just to remind everybody, the CAT is the Competition Appeals Tribunal. It's the specialist um, competition court set up in the UK and it is the tribunal that deals with this specialist opt-out antitrust class actions regime. 
So the CAT has said that it was satisfied that giving over such information would give the defendant an unfair tactical advantage. However, the CAT, the tribunal, has also, in various of the CPOs, confirmed its willingness to scrutinise the funding arrangements very carefully. So funders and expert firms are also working very closely together to research and test claims to bring as the regime finds its legs. Now, viewing this development alongside the lowered bar for class certification in the UK, this increased presence and activity increases the chance of claims being brought that may not have otherwise been pursued here because it wouldn't have been economically viable for individuals to do so on their own behalf. This really is new territory for us here in the UK. Next slide, please. So coupled with these developments in litigation, the UK government and regulators have also increased their expression of interest and focus on antitrust for fintech, with the CMA in particular advocating for tighter regulation. Several initiatives have been put in place, including the Digital Regulation Cooperation Forum, the Digital Markets Unit, Phase 2 of the um, FCA's Digital Sandbox, and an as yet unnamed replacement for the Open Banking Implementation OB entity, also called OBI. These initi initiatives should bring some much needed clarity and consistency in a complicated regulatory landscape for the fintech sector in the UK. However, in the two years since the UK has left the EU, the post-Brexit competition regime and the CMA's role in it is still developing. Substantive progress has been hampered by the fact that the legislation intended to give effect to the post-Brexit regime is yet to be proposed, with the government perhaps more focused on other priorities. So, the Digital Regulation Cooperation Forum. Now, almost two years ago, it was formed by the CMA, so the Competition Markets Authority, the FCA, the Financial Conduct Authority, Ofcom, and the Information Commissioner's Office, with the goal of ensuring cooperation and consistency in the regulation of online platforms and digital services. And since its establishment, the forum has done things like setting up a horizon scanning um, program to pool its knowledge and understanding of emerging technologies. And the CMA head has recently said that the forum would soon publish two joint papers on the algorithms used by big tech companies. The CMA having previously expressed concerns about the opacity of algorithms and the need for more competition oversight to protect consumers. The UK government has also recently requested the four regulators in the forum to set out a two year plan of how they intend to work together. Now, the founders of the forum have said that they need legislative reform to realise the forum's full potential. They would like to have statutory footing similar to that that is planned for the digital markets unit. Now, since 2021, we've also had the CMA's DMU, the digital markets unit, working on a future antitrust regime for the largest tech firms. It's been operating in shadow form on a non-statutory basis since last April, but the legislation necessary to make it fully effective has yet to be proposed and the deadline for moving things forward has recently slipped, while the EU, as we know, is pushing ahead with its Digital Markets Act. We will see in next month's Queen's speech for the opening of Parliament whether our bill will be on the next parliamentary agenda or if there are going to be further delays in that legislation. Despite requiring legislative empowerment of the DMU, the CMA has also actually begun to pursue investigations in large tech firms in the meantime, opening three investigations into suspected abuse of big tech in the market, which are be being also probed, as we understand it, by the EU Commission. The CMA has stated that it's actually working very closely with the Commission in respect of one of these investigations, but we will need to wait and see the extent to which that cooperation plays out and all the, also the extent to which we see further parallel investigations. We've also seen the FCA announce last month that it is going to run a second phase of their digital sandbox, this time focusing on ESG data and disclosure a hot topic for regulators of late. Um, I should also note um, for my US audience that the FCA has concurrent competition regulation powers with the CMA for its sector. Now, this digital sandbox um, is intended to provide innovators with access to a suite of tools to collaborate and develop financial services proofs of concept, including for innovated, innovations related to retail and wholesale banking, such as consumer data, payments processing, and SME lending. In engaging early with potential market disruptors, the FCA appear to be seeking a proactive and collaborative approach to the regulation of their digital marketplaces. Now, finally, the open banking implementation entity. In 2017, nine prominent banks were ordered by the, IC, by the CMA to set up 
this entity, the OB, to drive competition, innovation and transparency in the UK retail banking sector, particularly for challenger banks and other fintech firms. However, fintech firms have recently expressed their dismay at the delay and lack of clarity for open banking in an open letter to the CMA. The letter highlights the sector's desire to have simplification of what in one industry insider has called the regulatory spaghetti soup. The CMA has replied to the specific concerns raised in the letter and mo most recently, in conjunction with Treasury and the banking regulators, has announced that they will be creating a new entity which will take over regulatory oversight of open banking from OB. Now, this as yet unnamed future entity, that's what they call it, capital F, capital E, future entity, um, is expected to continue with OB's responsibilities, but the exact details would be subject of consultation before announcement at the end of this year, and then there's an expectation that transition from the OB will follow. So a lot of good initiatives there, they're just being delayed in their actual progress progression of um, concrete actions. So I've quickly run through the fact that we've got increased regulatory interest in the fintech sector, albeit with some rather slow progress, rapid growth in litigation funding with funders and experts working together to come up with potential claims, and then an opt-out class actions regime finally getting underway. With each decision that we get in this CPO regime, we learn more about how the tribunal expects to see on key issues such as aggregate damages methodology and class definition. The process of seeking a CPO should, as a result, become less onerous and we're likely to see more of them. So with follow-on and standalone damages claims more likely to be brought on a collective basis here in the UK and greater regulatory interest in the sector, firms with a UK presence or other links to our jurisdictions are potentially hugely more exposed to a greater list, risk of litigation in which large classes seek, frankly, eye-watering sums. Other fintech players may be also watching this regime and think it provides them with greater access to redress. Watch this space. Now, this concludes the formal part of this webinar, um, and we hope that the information that Gail, Tom and I have shared with you today has been useful to you. Thank, thank you, Early. And, and while we wait for some of those questions to, to pop into the, the Q&A screen, let, let me just ask um, you know, to, to both you and to Gail, I mean, one of the issues that I think that really seems qu quite apparent here is that as the lines break down between tech and traditional financial services and fintech, and you kind of have, you know, the, this blurry this this blurry outline that goes through where you, people are kind of dabbling in all the different spaces, you're not really sure how it's going to play out. Um, just as you have that in the marketplace, you know, as I noted before, you kind of have that in the regulatory space as well, where you have all the different regulators who are saying, you know, I might be involved here or I might be involved in that aspect. And I was wondering, you know, Gail, as, as kind of uh, a, a former regulator, um, you know, at the FTC, you know, how if you can offer, you know, any kind of advices to see, you know, how you would you would expect that to play out in terms of kind of cooperation, but also early from the foreign component too, to the extent you see UK regulators looking at what's going on in the US or elsewhere and how they might cooperate as well, you know, across uh, jurisdictions and geographies. Yeah, no, that's a great, that's a great question. And it requires us to think less like antitrust lawyers or particular, you know, uh, particular specialist lawyers and think more holistically about Okay, if you're in the fintech space, what are the legal issues you need to care for? It's antitrust, but it's also regulatory to your point, Tom. I think that's important to, to acknowledge. And that's even more challenging in a space where the regimes may be changing, the legal regimes may be changing. Um, I wanna ask, actually toss a corner of that question to Ehrlich here and talk about jurisdictional reach. So let's say I'm a fintech company, You know, let's say I'm based in the United States. Um, what uh, activities of mine do or do not um, render me subject to, let's say, UK jurisdiction, such that I need to tune into issues involving the CMA and the CFA and the rest? Of, of course, Gail. So that's a very, very good question. And obviously, having some sort of um, formal um, entity presence here in the UK would be um, sufficient to bring you within the re regime's jurisdiction. But mostly what we're looking at here is, is and which I would think would be of most interest to the people who are dialed in today, is whether they have UK customers. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it's really going to be something which I think 
players in the States who, who might not otherwise pay attention to what we are doing across the pond, given the way that this sector is developing and the globalization of, of consumers and customers should really be following what, we, what is happening over here. Makes sense. Two other observations too. Uh, um, as many of you probably saw yesterday, the CFPB announced that it was going to be kind of dusting off its its non bank uh, authority under under the Dodd Frank Act to to look at non bank entities. Um, that just shows that this space is continuing to evolve, which you know makes it so exciting from a marketplace perspective, but also from a regulatory and litigation perspective as well. That every day there's essentially something new in the space, which shows. Why, you know, wh whatever you think you knew in the past is, is we're kind of constantly learning. And there's always going to be a new challenge. And to the extent any of those issues, uh, you know, arise, feel free to reach out. You know, we're happy to answer questions on that front, given that it's ever changing. Uh, and, you know, the, and the other point that I would note as well, too, is one thing to keep in mind. We talked a lot about liability and, and regulatory issues for the fintechs themselves. One of the areas that you see, given the increased partnerships, too, is potential you know, third party liability that might be out there as there's partnership between fintechs and financial institutions or partnerships between fintech uh, and big tech. And that's something that sometimes can get a little bit lost in the shuffle if you're not the primary target, but rather you know, the, the third party who might still be swept in the same un, under uh, and looked under the same umbrella as the other entity and, and swept with the same brush. So I would say, you know, to the extent you have those partnerships that are in place, it's an area to look at as well um, from a regulatory standpoint and from a litigation standpoint. Obviously, from litigation, you know, the, the, the plaintiff's bar will, will generally cast a wide net and can, can look at a lot of entities. But our, our sense is that you probably will see that from a regulatory standpoint as well. Uh, and there could very well be challenges to a regulator kind of stepping outside of it, its, its normal turf to look at a partner program based on the, the partnership with the entity that is traditionally within that regulator's reach. So just another issue to kind of think about as we sort through kind of this evolving landscape that, that that's in place. Um, like I said, feel free to offer any questions if, if you want through the chat. We have a, a, a few more minutes. Um, otherwise, let me see if Gail and Arlie, if there's anything else or concluding remarks that you would like to, to make. I'd like to um, develop a, a theme that I think Arlie referred to earlier. Early, you mentioned that there were a couple of excessive pricing precedents uh, that are bubbling up in UK law. Now, I think that our fintech audience would find it very interesting to know what those precedents mean for the fintech space. Do you have any thoughts you can share with us on that? Apologies, taking myself off mute. Um, yes, I, I think it's something where we're seeing we've got one CPO that's been granted in relation to um, an opt-out class action regarding excessive pricing, which was in respect of um, the UK's largest telco against um, a very small subset of their consumers who are seen to be particularly vulnerable. And to give you some further background on that, it's their landline only um, customers. So no internet, no bundling of services whatsoever. Um, and the concern there is that um, because they are so vulnerable and they need that landline and they have no access to ways in which they can interrogate whether the service that they're being provided with is priced appropriately, appropriately or not, it is something that the new opt-out class actions regime is really something that should be um, paid attention to. And we're seeing that as well with respect to the CPOs that are waiting in the wings, all of which, um, the three of which I mentioned are, are concerning big tech. So it's about whether consumers who don't perhaps feel that they have any, any, any um, uh, power in which to influence um, the way in which they're being presented with particular pricing can be offered an opportunity to get redress from, from that situation by this regime. And it's something as well that we're seeing consumer advocates in particular, those who are motivated enough to become a proposed class representative, which I have to say is probably a very small pool of people because it's quite an onerous um, position. Um, and it's very difficult to put yourself in, into that position and be an appropriate candidate. Um, they're, they're quite vocal about what they see as being the um, uh, power imbalance between 
entities which present you um, with uh, the terms and conditions of their services and as an individual consumer, how can you influence that? So I would really suggest to anybody in the fintech sector who is in a position where they are offering their services online in such a way or presenting terms and conditions to really quite closely um, pay attention to, to the way in which they're framing them. And it's not just about access to, um, it's not just about granting access to personal data to use a platform, for example, it's not just about money, it can be in various ways. So for example, in one of these potential CPOs, we're seeing that an excessive price is being extracted from consumers um, in the way that they're being asked to provide their data in return for what is otherwise perhaps seen as a free service. I hope that's answered your question, Gail. Absolutely, thank you so much. I thought that was really interesting and I'm glad you were able to give us those insights. Okay. Tom, back to you. Yeah. No, well, well th thank you everyone for taking the time out of your busy days to uh, to join us today for this topic. Uh, as we said at the beginning, to the extent there are any questions that you, you weren't able to ask, feel free to reach out to any of us and we're happy to connect with you on those topics. But otherwise, that uh, concludes today's webinar. We hope that the information that we shared was useful. And again, we thank you for making time out of your day to join us. Take care.